Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. How's the sound on the mic for local access? We're good? Good. Really appreciate being invited here today. The problem is that, in many ways, um, Dom Cloud took a lot of the fun stuff last week or the week before. <laughs> um, but there are, as you're going to see, there are a lot of things that the city of St. Albans does. We get celebrated a lot for some of the transformational things we do, things we do that typically municipalities in the state don't do. And I think Dom covered a lot of that about the, uh, realizing the risk of doing nothing in a crisis and realizing that you have to get involved in transforming your community, deciding what people want to see and just making sure that it happens. Um, I'm happy to say that one of the things he talked about, the Bellevue redevelopment, the TIF bond that supported that passed yesterday along with the city budget and many other things on uh, town meeting day and we appreciate the voters' support for everything we've been doing. We've consistently had the voters' support, uh, two to one, three to one, for things like our TIF bonds and other, and other items on the ballot. So, and that's been essential. And I think that's been a key, toward, um, a, a key to what we've been able to do is that we've had the community, the city council, and the voters realizing the same vision every step along the way, and making sure we don't stick our necks out collectively until everyone's on board and on the same page and agrees with where we should go going forward. So my presentation is titled uh, Planning for the Future of the City of St. Albans and in many ways I'm going to cover some of the things that a municipality typically does but we still have some exciting projects and we have some things we really need to do and that we really need to address in the um, mostly in the near future but also looking further out as well. Um, you know, I'm going to start with infrastructure, and there are many ways in which you might think of infrastructure in a municipality like the city. I remember when we were looking at this plan back in 2011, this was the plan for our streetscape project that we did on Main Street in downtown, where it seemed really ambitious with what we were about to do. We were going to rebuild all of our sidewalks, add more um, pedestrian safety aspects, uh, complete streets planning that it's typically called, things like um, creating uh, bump outs for our crosswalks to narrow the crossing distance, and, and in many ways just make downtown look a lot nicer and create a new sense of place. Um, the bricks and the banners and the trees and all the landscaping that everyone celebrates every summer and um, the street lights and the things that keep it bright during the nights in the winter a lot of that came out of the streetscape project. This was a run-of-the-mill municipal street and sidewalk project, but it was transformational for us, for our downtown, for the community, and it, and it, and it showed you know, what we can do and what we can accomplish when we do just typical municipal projects. Um, but then there are lots of other things that the, that the city does uh, for, for our, our little municipality and then also in the town of St. Albans is we've got a wastewater treatment plant, an essential, an essential municipal service, an essential piece of infrastructure that we need to make sure that we manage and address, and has some problems associated with it that I'm going to get to in a little bit. But, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to do, we wouldn't be what we are today if we didn't have a way of appropriately managing our waste, for instance. And then, you know, new things like, you know, whoever thought that the city would have a parking garage, but we did. We built it in 2014. Um, a member of our design advisory board at one point suggested that we change the color of the concrete so it's not just a boring gray. And, 
we went with a pink, and I think we ended up with the prettiest parking garage in the state of Vermont, <laughs> um, which is interesting. But, uh, you know, the parking garage and the streetscape itself get to a couple, some of the things we're trying to accomplish with city infrastructure in, in the city of St. Albans. Um, obviously, we're providing city services. We're providing a place for people to walk, to drive your car. Uh, you got to make sure there's water coming out of the faucet when you turn it on. You got to make sure that there's a place for whatever's in the toilet to go when you flush it. Um, but also things like the trees um, and uh, storm water and other things. That's what we consider to be city infrastructure. And we have to provide those services. But also we found that good infrastructure and ambitious projects can attract <laughs> vibrancy and investment. And that private investment will follow public investment. When a community is ambitious and goes out to improve itself and goes out to improve its real built things and make things look nice, uh, the private market will do the same to some extent. And then we have to meet regulatory requirements. And that's a challenge and they're always changing. I'm going to get a little bit more into um, that realm as well. But that's a key thing. We need to follow the rules that come down from the state and the feds. And sometimes that will change what or well, the way we do things in the city and it will change um uh it'll add to the things we have to do looking forward and it's actually been one of the things that most affects some of our activities in the near future um when we redid the streetscape in the downtown and it went beyond main street and includes lake street kingman street parts of federal street uh it it really created a new sense of vibrancy and pride in the community. And it takes a lot to keep taking care of it, and we're always doing our best, and sometimes we need to work a little harder at it, but normally in the summer, downtown, you know, just explodes with color, and in the winter, you know, we, we shine with the lights on the trees, and that's the standard, that's sort of the new standard that we try to meet now. And it's helped create a great first impression, uh, attract businesses here, attract new residents here, uh, when people come from all over the country and beyond to get their passport dealt with at the passport agency, we get so many comments in the businesses and just from folks walking down the town. When Mayor Tim Smith, I guess when he's walking down the street, he'll just stop random people and ask where they're from, which is, I guess that's why he's mayor and I'm not. But um, <laughs> he'll hear things like why, why they came to the city and how much they love it. And many of us probably still hear today from folks who haven't been here in a while about how it looks a lot different than it used to. Uh, we've got another roadway project uh, that we're working toward. It's a big piece of what I consider the future of what, what, we're, what we're going to be very active in doing, and it's the Federal Street Multimodal Connector, a project that's actually older than I am because the idea of bypassing Main Street came about in the 60s and the 70s. And it's not exactly that anymore, but uh, what we have is an opportunity to make a lot of improvements in getting around the city, and especially on the uh, western side of the city. How many people re recognize this project or have heard about it before? Because we've talked about it for many years, and it's always been about um, making sure we have the money to pull it off. And I, I think we're nearly there. We got a big federal grant, $7 million, and then we just received some more voter support from the city for TIF funding yesterday. And we're, we've restarted the process of planning this project, getting back into it with the engineering and the design and the permitting. We're going to get to a point where we update the plans and we update all the estimates and we see uh, if we think we have enough money to get it done in today's market, with construction prices being what they are today. But basically, what the Federal Street Project is going to do is pick us up right here at the end of that little state access highway that goes to exit 19, right? And put a traffic signal there. And then build a new street that goes behind the houses on Nason and connects with Lemna Drive. And then the project goes down Lemna Drive, crosses Lower Weldon, Allen Street, connects with where we already made some improvements in the area of Lake Street and Federal. And then it goes down Federal, hangs a right at Lower Newton, and gets you back on Main Street. Now, that's not a great bypass, um, but 
what we learned a long time ago is that this project probably, it's, this can't be a Main Street bypass because there's no way to get traffic past Lower Newton with the way the rail corridor and other private properties are set up. But what it can do is it can make a lot of great improvements to areas of the city that need more multimodal function and safety. And a lot of people are using this part of the city to get back and forth, but it was never really built for that. We can finally solve that problem. But some of the things that excite me most about this project, looking forward into the future, is, is putting that traffic signal at the bottom of the state access highway means that trucks are more likely to take that left turn to the um, town industrial park. And they're less likely to do the thing that they've been doing, which is use Upper Weldon Street, which we don't like. Um, Upper Weldon Street is not wide enough for even one truck, much less, a, much less a truck and your car as you're coming up upon them. Uh, but also, this traffic light would make the pedestrian crossing at this street much safer. We have kids who are walking to St. Albans Town Education Center along South Main Street, and they have to cross that crosswalk at the bottom of the state access highway. We also have a lot of new residents at the south end of the city and into the town. Um, that hit, hit, this, hit this barrier every time if they're on that side of the street. So I, I really, one of the thing, one of the highlights for, the, for me for this project is being able to put in that traffic light and better manage traffic in that area. Um, providing the new street means that if you're coming off of exit 19 into the city and you're trying to get west into the city, um, you could now make use of a new street, get on the Linda Drive, and then um, go in that way. Uh, but then also a new uh, traffic signal here at Federal and Lower Newton, um, talking to the one up at Newton and Maine, which needs some improvements, um, will help both the vehicular traffic, but also once again, you know, these signals can stop traffic for pedestrians as well. And we have a lot of redevelopment that we're planning to do at Fonda, housing redevelopment. We got 30 units of senior housing that have already been permitted there and we're working to partner with a developer to build 87 more units of workforce housing. We're going to have more traffic here, we're going to have more walkers here and this is going to make it safer for them. But another one of the plans is to create a new shared use path down Federal Street that will connect an extension of the rail trail with downtown. The state is planning to extend the Missisquoi Valley Rail Trail right along the Fonda property to stop at Lower Newton. This is a great opportunity to create a better linkage between downtown and the rail trail. And we've heard from some walk and bike advocates in the area that they really want us to try and put a shared use path on Federal Street. This is going to be tough because the green belt there is already pretty narrow. But we think we're going to, we're going to be able to make it work. That's one of the things we're into. Like, we got the new federal funding for Federal Street and we kind of had to get back into it with, the with all the designers and the engineers and everyone, VTrans and everyone else say, all right, this is what we want to do. Let's, let's make sure these plans still work and let's see what we can do with this project. Um, so that's one of the things that is going to be taking up a lot of our time in the near future. We, we really are intent to build the Federal Street project uh, and get it done finally and, and get it off the books and into reality. Uh, any questions about Federal Street? Yes? So will there be a, a light? Uh, like, how are we going to be able to cross Lake Street? Are we still doing the four-way stop there? Yeah, the four-way stop at Lake Street is probably going to remain. And what we ran into there is that um, when you put a traffic signal so close to railroad tracks, you end up having to put another red light out past the railroad tracks because your red light might back people up and then stop people on the tracks. So when we were planning that intersection, which we've technically already done, we did that intersection a few years ago, we were into the conversations with VTrans and the railroad and they started talking about how these are the codes that we have to meet, these are the things we'd have to do to put a traffic signal here, and so it just got too expensive. You end up having to create two traffic signals instead of one. So that's why that intersection um, became a four-way stop. 
um, and happy to take questions throughout. Also, really at any point, you can, we can have a conversation about any other city project or anything you heard from Dom. Was it last week or the week before? Two weeks ago. But I'm going to go through a couple other things. Yes? Um, so I'm looking at all the streets. Are there many students who walk to school via that route? Yes, I think so. I mean, a good share of them use all the street. Okay, so um, is that into consideration to safety for them going down all the street? Yeah, we built a sidewalk on all this, uh, and there is a crosswalk on Federal that I believe has a flashing beacon right now. And, you know, we're, I, so we've done an improvement there. If, if we find out that more needs to be done, it is possible. But so far, we have, we have put a sidewalk down. We have a crossing on federal, and then the students can walk down all this to city school. John. This is a path made of parking area. So I'm meeting with the state in a couple weeks to find out what their plans are. That project sort of being driven by them, the extension of the rail trail. One of the things I'm going to say is, you know, do you have plans for a trailhead? I think we're happy to work with them. We are going to build a new city street along Fonda. That's one of the things that we have out to bid right now and we'll be building this year. So we'll actually have a city street that goes up past Fonda and will be along this new rail trail. So there's potential that we could create a curb cut for, a, for some parking for a trailhead. Yeah. But there's not a lot of room on Federal Street proper to do that because basically it's houses and businesses. And, um, so something would probably happen up here along Fonda, along where they're doing that extension. What I'm interested to find out is how they plan on people crossing Route 7. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, I'm not in charge of that. I mean, I'm sure we'll have some opinions. But uh, that's going to be an issue, is uh, crossing. Uh, I, if most folks probably know, the rail trail kind of starts next to the Maple City Diner. You drive up, there's parking, and you keep walking on the trail. Well, if they extend the trail, people are going to have to cross Main Street there. So maybe we can, uh, maybe we'll be able to make that whole area safer, slow traffic down. It'd be, I, I think it's good opportunities there. How critical is the rail trail? Uh, the actual rails, the actual tracks. Um, you're talking about... Are they used? The, the trail is used. No, the, the, the right. railroad tracks. The railroad tracks, uh, that corridor was part of the Lamoille, the Missisquoi Valley line that ended a long time ago and just hadn't ever... It was still owned by the... The, the section along Fonda was still owned by the railroad. The state never got that piece. That's why they never built the rail trail there too, right? So the city brokered the purchase of that stretch along Fonda between Lower Newton and Route 7 because we need our space for our city street, but the railroad wouldn't sell unless we bought the whole thing. Because what a rail trail allows you to do is um, maintain the railroad's right-of-way along that corridor. Otherwise, when a railroad stops using a rail line, they have to give all the land back to all the adjacent landowners, like a set of dominoes, and you lose it forever. So one of the reasons why rail trails exist in the United States is so you can, you can you're not using it for trains anymore, but if you build a trail, you can maintain that right-of-way. You don't have to give the land back to the landowners. And someday, if the rail, if rail ever becomes more relevant, they might put, put the rails back. But for now, it's just a rail trail. And that's actually the status that most rail trails are in, in, in around the country right now. So that's why we have rail trails where, where, where there were once actual train rails. And they always say, well, someday the trains may come back. And I don't know about that. But um, so it's, it's not a, obviously, it's not a viable rail line. We stopped having trains on there a long time ago. but. You never know. Does anyone remember when we created the stormwater utility in the city? The town has one now, too. It was uh, 2016. Um, what happened around then, around 2012, is that we new rules came down from the federal government, from the EPA, and then that the state had to impose upon us. 
is that we had to start doing more to treat the stormwater that goes into our brooks and into St. Albans Bay. Does everyone remember back when we were talking about St. Albans Bay and water quality around the state and all that great stuff back before other disasters came up and we got distracted? Um, but the city is under a mandate to retrofit ourselves to treat stormwater more around, around the city. And this is, a, this is a big challenge. It's another one of the things that city infrastructure has to react to. Uh, and it's another part of my future and my job is we're trying to figure out how we're going to do this. But you all know what happens when you build a bunch of roads and parking lots and buildings is that, you know, whenever it rains, the water hits those hard things. And back before we were here, the water would hit some ground and go into the soil and eventually get to the brook someday, right? Well, now a rain hits a roof or a parking lot or a street and it's going right to the brooks and it's going right now and it's not going to stop until it hits the brook. That's called stormwater. And when all that water hits the brooks at the same time during a storm, we end up with a lot of problems. One is it picks up a lot of pollution and gets into the brooks and then gets into the bay. And the other thing is that when it hits the brook at that speed, it starts eroding everything. So it picks up a bunch of sediment and then that all gets into the bay. It muddies up the brooks and it's just a bad scene altogether. In fact, stormwater is probably one of the first things that we built in the city after we built our streets because you know, every time it rained, our streets were muddy or whatever the heck they were made out of. It was just a disaster. So we built catch basins and underwater lines and tried to get that water to the brooks as, as quickly as possible during a storm event. Well, now we're dealing with the repercussions of that. So the city of St. Albans has to reduce how much water rushes into Rugbrook during a storm by 16%. And we have to reduce how much water rushes into Grice and Stevens Brook during a storm by 24%. And then on top of that, we have to reduce the phosphorus pollution that's getting into St. Albans Bay. 22% from all city streets and 55%. We have to reduce the phosphorus that gets to the bay from stream erosion by 55%. And one of the ways in which we're going to do that is try and figure out places where we can get in between the water and the brooks and stop the water, treat the water, do something to it during a storm, hold it, hold it in place for a while before it gets to the brooks all at once. That's typically stormwater treatment. We, um, we have this whole area for Rug Brook. This map's mostly up in the town. See, there's the interstate. This is a whole area determined by the state to provide, that provides too much pollution or too much flow to Rug Brook. And we have to deal with that somehow. And then, this is the area that feeds into Stevens Brook. Here are all the city streets on the east side, the town up on the hill. We got to figure out how to reduce the storm flows that go into Stevens Brook and Grice Brook in this area by 24%. Um, so what we've done is we've been working with consultants on figuring out where are places where we can build something that treats water during a storm before it gets to the brooks. Um, here's a map for Rug Brook. All these little shaded, these colored areas are sort of little sub watersheds where if we build something here, we'll treat all the water from this area. And if we treat enough areas in the city, we'll meet our goals of 16% and 24%. But it's hard in a city like ours to find places where there's enough space to actually make this happen because we're built out. Louise. So when you talk about treating it, what are you doing to it? Um, I got a picture of that right here. So, um, some, normally it's called a gravel wetland. And I don't know how many of you have seen one of these, but remember there used to be a lot of stormwater detention ponds, just ponds sitting there with water and just always had water in them, pretty much a bad scene. Well now, we do different things. We, we build facilities that have a lot of stone and have a lot of um, native wetland plants and sort of have the water meander around or have to go over this thing before it gets to the next thing. And so stormwater treatment normally looks like this. This is one right after a storm where there's still some standing water in the system. But you see a lot of gravel and you see a lot of uh, wetland plants like um, cattails and things like that. 
we call it a gravel wetland. So this is typically one of the things you would build. So it doesn't look like a wastewater treatment plant. It doesn't have a bunch of tanks and pumps and stuff, but it is technically a treatment facility. And what happens is that the water gets here before it gets to the brook and it gets slowed down and there, we find other ways to get the pollutants out of it. And then after a storm, it slowly infiltrates back into the, into the groundwater or into a brook. So it doesn't all hit it at the same time during a storm. Um, so we found a lot of places in the city where we think we might be able to build things like this. Uh, one of them is, for instance, you know, there's this old vacant piece of land off of Lemon Drive and Nason Street where we want to build one that'll treat some water from Saytech, treat some water from the St. Albans Access Highway, and sort of, you know, little by little, treat enough, of the, treat enough water from these areas to meet our federal goals. We got one on Lemna Drive that we're looking to build. This might actually be the first one we build. You know, if you're on Lemna Drive and you're driving by, you've got all the sort of the warehouses on one side and then you've got woods and the rail lines on the other. Well, that, those woods, that little patch of trees, is one place where we could fit something like this for stormwater treatment. But we've got a big one. Now this is a map that you might not be able to see very clearly, but this blue line shows that if we build gravel wetlands where those old cooling ponds are on Lower Weldon Street, across from Houghton Park, mm -hmm. we could treat water from half of downtown and down Lower Weldon Street. This is our biggest one. This would treat the most stormwater of all of the projects that we came up with. So it's a very important one, and it's one we're working on right now, to take those cooling ponds and turn them into a big gravel wetland instead and meet some of our stormwater goals doing projects like this. Um, any questions about stormwater? Well, Main Street does have some little pockets of... So yeah, those things along the park. Yeah, along the, along the, right. along the sidewalk there. Yeah, the, there are stormwater detention basins that take some of the water off the street and yeah, treat it. They're not very big. They're not very big. We, so for, to meet our goals, we need to go big. And you asked how we're going to pay for it. The stormwater utility was actually one of the reasons why we created that, is to pay for projects like this so that we can go after federal and state funding, but then we can use our utility for the local match or for any other. Right now, the utility's being spent on the planning and the design and the engineering for these projects. Soon enough, we'll start building them. Um, another infrastructure challenge that we've been dealing with, and this one folks probably know about because we hear about it now and then, is the combined sewer overflow. How many people have heard that <laughs> term before? Well, so if you look at this map and you look at all these reddish, pinkish areas on the map, see them? Those are the areas of the city where the catch basins are connected to the sewer system. You know, more often than not, when you build a stormwater system, you put your catch basins in the street and they catch the water and then the water goes underground and then it flows into a brook somewhere, right, or a ditch. Well, many communities, when they were managing stormwater, they just put the water into the sewer system instead, which is fine, because then that water gets treated at our wastewater treatment plant, and naturally, that's great. That's a great way to treat stormwater. If you have the capacity to take all that water during a storm. The problem is we don't, and many historic communities have this problem of a combined sewer overflow. What happens is that during a storm, all of that water gets into the catch basins, gets into the sewers, along with everything we're flushing down the toilet or, or putting down the sink, and it's too much for the system, and it overflows somewhere, which is nasty. I mean, it's mostly storm water. It's much more storm water than it is sewage, but it's not supposed to happen. And the feds and the state are clamping down on communities like us to eliminate this problem. We don't want to have a combined sewer overflow. You don't want to see the word sewer and overflow in the same sentence. <laughs> now this isn't about our plant. 
our wastewater treatment plant does have a, uh, shoot, what's the word? It's not overflow. There's a different word. There's a word for when there's too much water coming to the plant where some of it gets diverted and it gets treated before it goes to Lake Champlain. Not as much as it would be treated normally, but it gets shot with a bunch of chemicals and the E. coli is killed and, and all of that during a storm. What's happening in the city is that the actual sewer lines going to the plant, they actually surcharge and they can't actually get the water to the plant fast enough. So our combined sewer overflow doesn't happen at the wastewater treatment plant. That's not where it overflows. Does anyone know here where it overflows in the city? Yeah, there's a manhole, but do you know where it is? It's at the corner of South Elm Street and Lower Weldon. That is the lowest point in the city's sewer system, right at the corner of Houghton Park. <clears throat> That's where the sewer overflows during a storm. Now we built something so that it doesn't overflow into the street. It overflows, it just goes a little east right into Stevens Brook there, right where Lower Weldon Street crosses Stevens Brook. There's a little culvert that will overflow directly into Stevens Brook whenever we have an overflow. But if you'll recall, like back in July, no, when did this happen? No, this happened, um, oh man, I think it was January or December. We actually had flooding at Lower Weldon in South Elm. And that's when our overflow culvert also overflows, and so it does actually come out of the manhole at the intersection. We have to shut the intersection down for a bit, and then it drains down, and you know, we're just back to normal. So, how do you deal with a combined sewer overflow? What we really need to do over time is take these red areas in the city, or at least enough of them, and separate the storm water from the sewer system so that the rainwater is not getting into the sewer system. But there's another, there's another cheaper way to deal with this, and that's to start building storage for it. So we get about, um, I don't know, maybe a dozen overflow events during the course of a year when there's a lot of rain, or maybe when it rains and the ground is frozen, or there are various different factors that combine to create an overflow situation. And some of them are millions of gallons, but most of them are not. Most of them are under half a million gallons. Well, if we could store that half a million gallons during a storm and then just pump it into the sewer system afterward, it would never overflow. So we have a plan to store the overflows under Houghton Park through a series of chambers that would hold half a million gallons, put it under Houghton Park, put the grass back on top of it, and you wouldn't even know it's there except maybe there's a new manhole over in the corner. What we're working with our consultants to actually pivot this thing so that we don't, uh, uh, that we limit how much we would disturb the Steelers football field. But basically, this is the first significant step that we're gonna to take towards the CSO, is to build storage for the sewer um, and mostly stormwater under Houghton Park during a storm. If we take that half a million gallons and we store it, we would eliminate more than half of the times that the whole thing overflows. And then, after a storm, you just pump it into the sewer system and everything goes where it's supposed to go. Um, so, and then after this, we'll see when are we getting overflow <coughs> events and then how do we deal with those to eventually eliminate the overflow events altogether so that they don't happen anymore. Um, so that's another thing we're working on in, in the city in terms of infrastructure. Um, any other questions about infrastructure stuff? Oh, sorry. Are you sorry. expecting climate change to impact uh, the volume of the with? Uh, yeah, most likely we'll have more rain events. So it is definitely something we have to address. So that would mean storing more water, I suppose? Well, you know, I think probably it would be, you know, that we might be maximizing that site, but we might have to find other places to do storage or to pursue the separation and eliminate those red areas from the map that I showed you. But this will certainly provide it like an immediate, an immediate positive impact. Yeah. So we've got 
we've been in the planning stages in a lot of these projects, um, looking forward into the future, and it seems like we're getting to the point where we're going to start, we're really going to start building some of them, which is a, a nice place to be. When we, when we really talk about planning the future of the city, the title of the presentation, um, one, of the, one of the things we're actually supposed to do is come up with a plan for the city. It's called the city plan. Every, every community in Vermont that has zoning has to have a municipal plan. You need to go through a process by which you put together this document, have some public input, your planning commission, your city council or select board work together to come up with this, and then, and then you can have things like zoning. We're actually in the process of updating our city plan because we need to adopt a new one in 2025. And by state statute, this plan is supposed to include information on a lot of aspects of community life in the, in the city. Land use, housing, transportation, health and wellness, neighborhoods, economic development, socioeconomic issues, equity and natural resources. Um, typically, most of what comes out of this planning process is, are things like zoning and land use. But it is a, an opportunity to have a conversation, get input, and talk about what the city supports and what it would like to see happen in all of these realms, which is a pretty wide array of what affects quality of life in the community. In many ways, it'll say things like, the city will have zoning that does this, and then in other times it'll say, well, the city supports whenever someone else in the community wants to do that, because we can't do everything. But the plan's a good place to put those that intent, that goodwill, those policies, and those types of areas of support. You know, if you look at our plan right now, it talks about the way the city's laid out, uh, where we think, you know, how we think the neighborhoods should look, you know, making sure we take care of transportation, talking about some public safety trends, uh, highlighting areas like um, all this hill that we want to uh, preserve for their, you know, as being a natural place to walk around and recreate and that sort of thing. And not a lot will change, but there are some new things that have come up since 2017 when the last plan was done. Mostly equity. Um, there are a lot of new socioeconomic issues and housing is a huge issue right now. So I think those are some areas of the plan that will be receiving a lot of attention for the 2025 update. We did a survey that some of you might have done uh, last fall and we got um, responses from folks on questions like what excites them about St. Albans and what concerns them about the future and what do you like about your neighborhood. We, we received a lot of uh, support for providing more safety, but liking, liking our neighborhoods, liking our downtown, wanting, wanting more businesses to come to the community, wanting to find solutions for substance abuse and crime, and basically what, you do, what you would expect to hear. But the Planning Commission now is ready to take some of these survey responses and go out to various different stakeholder groups and say, well, okay, this is what we heard from our survey, but what do you think is missing in the responses? What, what are you seeing in the work that you do that you're not seeing here? Because we need to know about all of it. So we're, we're using the city plan survey as a way to then attract even more public input and make sure we're getting as broad a picture of what's going on and what people think needs to happen as we can. Is that acceptable anywhere in public that we're looking at online? Yeah, it's getting there. Yeah, I think it, it would be part of the, yeah, so that's a good question. Let's talk about the process for a second. The way a municipal plan is done is technically, t typically your, your planning commission pulls it together and then there are some hearings. And then it goes to your, in our case, our city council. And then there are some more hearings. And it's the city council that finally adopts the plan. It's, it's their plan. It's the city's plan, not just the planning commission's plan. So we'll be having meetings on this and talking about it and slowly pulling it together for the rest of this year. And we'll put things like this up online. And you know, anyone, there's, there's a, actually, I put it back here. We have a web page, it's just you go to the city, city site and you go slash city plan and we'll have a page that talks about what we're up to and what stage things are at. We'll be able to put these results there too. And everything else that we learn along the way. 
But a lot of the work happens at the Planning Commission, but they want to talk to, they want to, talk to a lot of folks and, and get a lot of input. Um, we, uh, we're trying to make this plan a little less um, stuffed with text, focus on just what are the things we want to do, and a little bit of data, and then a lot about what we've learned by talking to other people. Um, I want to do most of the drafting this year so that in 2025 we can just focus on holding our hearings, make sure that we get everything adopted in time and we aren't under the gun too much. But like I said, the city council adopts it. There's going to be public input throughout. All the meetings will be public and we'll try and keep people informed as, as the process goes on. Um, what are some key issues that people in this room think should be addressed in the city plan? Any ideas? I heard someone talking about the need for se senior housing earlier. Yeah. Um, not, not exactly something the city can do, right? But what we do in, in a plan like this is we talk about why it's needed, why it's important. We put in statements of support. Um, we identify some of the folks who are involved in it. So if there's ever a chance to go for a grant or to implement a policy that might somehow help make more senior housing in the community, you can point to the plan and say, there it is. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's probably, uh, probably the section on housing is going to talk about that issue, about, you know, there are a lot of different types of people who need more housing. Um, the solution is just to build more of any type of housing. It doesn't really, right now, let's not get too worked up about if it's this type or that type. Right now, right, what we need is more housing because if this new house can be moved into by these folks, then they can free up some housing that might be more uh, applicable just for, to some other folks that also need it. That sort of spillover effect. This is related to what we need, but it, it's worth announcing that in Yankee Magazine, mm -hmm. this month, I don't know if you all know, but there's a section that celebrates where you should live in New England, and St. Albans is featured. Yep. Do you, did you know that? I saw that. I don't know where we can buy the magazine, however. I don't either, but I know that when you go to their website, you can see it. You can see it there. you got to open the newest issue and you flip through the pages on your computer and then there we are. Yeah. But it's pretty spectacular that we've progressed to the point that we're getting at least New England recognition as right. a prime place in Vermont. Yes, that is great. I mean, it wasn't um, Manchester or Stowe or one of the yeah. residential ones. Right. It was our St. Albans. Yes. It's, it's nice to get that, uh, I mean, we know we're on the right track. We, we know we like what we've accomplished, um, but it is also nice to see, see it being recognized by those outside the city and outside the state, yeah. In adding uh, so much housing, how will that affect schools? Well, you know, the school, the schools are, it's interesting, you know, a school that, a school that could have held a certain number of students when I was a kid now uh, would be, would seem overcrowded with a smaller amount of children because there are just so many more things they have to put into the building, which is interesting. So we do sometimes hear concerns from the school district about, you know, more growth and more kids. We're like, we're at capacity for children. But at the same time, when it comes to the way the state funds schools, the more students you have, the, um, the more you get from the state toward your budget. So um, it's more a matter of, you know, can you find a way to, to serve an additional number of students with the, with the facilities that you have. And one of the strengths of the Maple Run District is since they unify, they can, I mean, they have the ability to um, make use of all the schools in the district. Uh, I don't you know, it's, it's not, my, not my role to say how it would work, but at least they have the ability to, um, to direct all the facilities that they have under their control to deal with some of these issues. But I do think that, you know, I, 
I, it, it's great to have more families with children and more children in general moving into the community, but I don't think it's happening to such a degree that all new housing means many, many more kids. In many ways, what we're hearing is the folks that need housing are single, single households, like people who live by themselves. So the housing, housing's going to be taken up by households that don't have children as well, to a high degree. Any other questions? The things we'd like to see in the city plan? Are we perfect? I mean, there's nothing to change. We're good? We're done? <laughs> we don't really need to plan anymore? Richard? How about getting the Amtrak from Munner to Montreal? Oh, yeah, that's in there. Um, you know, I, I don't have any update on that. I think it's still some matter of treaty between border control, between uh, the U.S. and Canada on getting a pre-check facility somewhere in Montreal. And I don't know. I don't know how soon that's going to come about, but um, you know, we, we, think the dele we think our federal delegation still has it as a priority. What about bus, bus service? We're going to get some more bus service at some point? You know, I know that um, there are folks who are talking to the city manager about getting Greyhound back into downtown. I don't know what the status of that conversation is, but I know that there's interest. I don't, know what, I don't know what has to happen on Greyhound's side to make it work, but I think there's a conversation there. John? Is the task force uh, going to stay with us? We're going to do everything we can to make sure they do. Uh, I do know that it we takes a long... Have, we don't have that lady on our side anymore. Right. Yeah, and that's an issue. But we've gotten, um, we've gotten a lot of support from... Our, from the three members of our delegation right now that they know it's a huge issue for us. They'll do what they can. And if the city has to get involved and build a new place for them, then we'll figure out how to make that happen. But that's a very high priority. Keeping the Passport Center downtown is a big deal for us. So we're going to work hard on that. Well, we see a lot of people at the museum. Yeah, waiting, right. Waiting, waiting, you know. Yep. They have to do not a four hour or more wait before the passport is actually ready for them mm -hmm. to come back. And they're oftentimes directed to the museum. Yeah. And they, they, they kind of fall in love with St. Albans with the downtown area. I know, it's that captive audience. I mean, <clears throat> every downtown wishes they had people who were forced to be there for four hours. <laughs> It's a huge, it's a huge, uh, you know, we didn't really know about it, actually, quite frankly. Um, we didn't understand what was going on until we started hearing the stories of these people from the Passport Center, and they love it, and they're here to get their passports, and we're like, oh, and then, then we realize, and we really realize how much of a, how much of a gem it is for our downtown. Great. located in different places, but what we do know is that the staff at the Passport Center has been um, told that they're probably going to be moved to a different location. Mm -hmm. But it's still, it's very preliminary and we think it can be changed and it's, no matter what, it's going to take a long time anyway, so we have time to try and figure out um, how to keep them here. 
But when it comes to the immigration processing center that used to be at the bottom of Lower Weldon Street, that we did lose that office. It's gone. Those workers are gone, and <clears throat> the property's been purchased by someone else to do other things. And quite frankly, like I said, don't waste a crisis. Um, the the housing and the and the building the residential, bringing more residents downtown is going to be the key. Uh, post COVID. Offices aren't quite as necessary anymore. There aren't as many people coming downtown for jobs anymore. The jobs have left downtown to much degree, but we have lots of people who are clamoring for housing and would love to live downtown. Not everyone wants to live downtown, but many people do. And the projects that we have, that we're working on, like the Bellevue redevelopment and, and the housing at Fonda, um, they'll probably get leased up pretty quickly. And now we'll have many new residents and folks we know living, living right downtown and wanting to go to a coffee shop or go to a restaurant or walk around, enjoy Taylor Park and keep things looking vibrant. So what's considered downtown, Jeff? Oh, uh, well, downtown, the designated downtown is um, from the, uh, the corner of Brainerd and Main Street to BFA and that, then down Lake Street to Holy Angels. And then it includes, all, it includes Kingman Street, it includes part of Federal Street, and of course it includes the park and, and Church Street. And that's it. That's downtown, but it's still a good size of the city. The historic district is what we call it. Yeah. It includes the historic district and more. Yeah. Yeah. Richard. Unless it's not the city is a railroad building on Federal Street, should they get some hope for some future for that? Oh well, yeah, something will happen there, but I think it's a matter of the market, and you know they're going to have to lower their asking price, or they just haven't found the buyer who wants it enough to pay what it's being listed for. Um, and I think that if we find an opportunity for the city to help broker something there, then we're you know, we're, still, we're certainly talking to folks. It's just we haven't found that vision and all the puzzle pieces to, to get it to the next step yet. Yeah. But we will. Someone will. Jim Cameron not interested. He can't get Jim to go after that. Well, he's kind of busy. It's a big building for Jim. I mean, if you don't know, and people that don't know, Jim Cameron, he's the person who fixed up the St. Albans house, and then he actually renovated City Hall for us, and he, uh, he purchased the old court and customs house at the bottom of Kingman Street, and so he's the person fixing that building up. Um, commercial on the first floor and eight apartments. That's nothing to shake a stick at. Um, so he's, he's uh, one of the people in the area that's well versed in fixing up historic buildings. I don't know, I don't know if he's going to be working on that one or not. Let's, let, let's get that courthouse fixed up first, then he can go into something else. Is there any plan that, um, or talk of, at the city level about St. Mary's Church? We've had some discussions with the church. <clears throat> one of the issues that, one of the, part of their situation is that the Burlington Diocese doesn't have a bishop right now. And what we've been told is that the diocese can't make property moves unless there's a bishop to make the decision. So it's sort of in limbo until there's someone who can start making some final decisions. The law office of uh, Gone and Cahill and I guess Manahan. Um, they moved out of the upstairs and the main street. Yes. And so that's an opportunity for some housing, I would think, up there. Yeah. Um, chances are it'll be housing when you look at the market. I mean, that's where you make your money right now. And there are examples of folks who have fixed up their second floors. Um, uh, for instance, a Pocket Realty did that in the building that they own, put, put in some new apartments above their office. Uh, it, it'll take time, you know, everyone who's been looking for a contractor knows how hard it can be, but yeah, I think that that, you'll probably end up seeing residences in that building as well. There's 22 steps up there. <laughs> <laughs> there that's are... A long way, it's a long high ceiling up there. That's a well-known issue, you know, that we have programs that have existed for a while to help with updating historic buildings to code and dealing with things like elevators and sprinklers and so there are there are things that could be used to to get it there for sure
Any final questions for Chip? Chip Sawyer, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.